have all of you here go on and continue to add in the chat where you're from as you come on board and we're going to get started. Welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's Fall Virtual Speaker Series. It has been a marvelous several months of incredible speakers who have pushed us to think beyond our boundaries, to see the world in new ways, to look at art and history and literature and architecture as means for us to move forward in this world as a fuller community, as a beloved community. Um, I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. You also see here Tess Galen, who is our Events Coordinator, along with a number of our, our other staff and board members who are joining us online. We all welcome you here, whether you are a member of 50 years, a brand new member of the Athenaeum, a guest from another membership library, or someone who is the first time with the Athenaeum, we welcome you. If you are looking for a community of people who are passionate about learning and thinking and talking together and listening and moving forward, we invite you to consider becoming a part of our community. We welcome you to become a part. Before I, uh, I, in, I, what was my word? I just blanked out on my word. Before I introduce to you our very distinguished speaker tonight, I want to remind you how to use the Zoom screen for tonight's program. If you are on a a laptop or a computer, you will see up in the upper right hand corner, it will either say gallery view or speaker view. I invite you to get it so that the speaker, Professor Gloud, is the person you are seeing when he is talking. So you don't have to look at, at Tess and I um, for, for the most best experience you could possibly have. At the bottom, you will see both an icon for Q&A and an icon for chat. If at any time during the program you have a question, please put them there. When Professor Gloud is done with his, his talk, I will moderate those questions with him and we look forward to a lively conversation. And at this point, you, you may have seen, if you've been on the radio, if you've been on the TV at any time in the past week or past months, you have likely seen Professor Gloud. He is a regular commenter on um, on MSNBC, as well as other shows. He is um, a writer, a columnist for Time Magazine. Uh, in fact, it's on Saturday's online issue of the magazine. Um, Professor Eddie Glau Jr. states that from the beginning, Americans have imagined a way of being together as a country that takes for granted a kind of selfishness that masquerades as liberty and freedom. And his deep study of the works and life of James Baldwin suggests another way to be a United States with shared commitments that is rooted in a terrifyingly honest and committed and mature love. And he will talk about that tonight as he speaks from his latest book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. But first, let me tell you, Professor Gloud grew up in Moss Point, Mississippi and holds degrees from Morehouse College, from Temple University and Princeton University. He is the chair of the department of, um, I have to look at my stuff. I'm having trouble tonight seeing, just like I just needed to take those drops, Professor Gloud. <laughs> he is the uh, James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Princeton University, and the author of numerous award-winning and acclaimed books, including Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, which has been described as one of the most imaginative, daring books in the 21st century, and Exodus, Religion, Race, and Nation in the Early 19th Century Black America, which was awarded the Modern Language Association's William Sanders Scarborough Book Prize. We are honored to have you with us this evening to bless our, for our stage here at virtually this evening, Professor Gloud, and I invite everybody to join me from across the United States. Let's give him a welcome, Professor Gloud. Thank you so much, Beth, for that gracious introduction. And thank you, Tess, for all the work that you're doing behind the scenes and all the people who, um, who have made this possible. I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here with you this evening. I have to take off my signature blue glasses because I can't, there's for seeing, not necessarily for reading. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know, the virtual world can make things easier, uh, but but it also presents interesting sorts of challenges. Uh, particularly, I would love to see you, to see your faces, but um, to interact with you. But you know, this is these are our times. 
So, but, but I'm thankful for all of those who are behind the scenes making this possible, and I'm excited about our conversation. So I hope I can offer a few words that may prick your conscience um, in this moment of, of profound transition and challenge. So I, I don't want to spend too much time here, so let me just jump into it. Uh, so we gather tonight. And it is night here. I know you have some folks in Oregon and California and the like. But we gather today or tonight against the backdrop of a nation on, on a knife's edge. Even after the election. Are we really after the election is a question we might have to ask ourselves. The divisions within the country, white, black, rural, urban, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, are all in full view. And it feels deeply, I think, as if the institutions and norms of our democracy are collapsing right in front of our bloodshot eyes. An imperial presidency for the last four years that has seemingly been out of control. The People's House stymied by hyper-partisanship. The Senate, the, the nation's deliberative body by all measures seem to be broken. We've even witnessed for a moment at least the politicization of the military and of course, the debates, the arguments, the fears around the courts. All of this is happening in the context of a global pandemic that has us stuck in our homes, fearful. COVID-19 ravages the country. Americans are dying alone. And those who love them must grieve with the regret of not being able to say goodbye properly. Grief tinged with regret lasts, cuts deep. The economy is in tatters. It's a K recovery, not a U. But that's too abstract. Millions are unemployed and hunger grips this nation. But the top 1% thrives. They are getting richer as death travels from door to door. And then you combine all of that with the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, or the death of Walter Wallace in Philadelphia, the police killing of Trafer Pillarin in Lafayette, Louisiana, the public murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the death of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, the death of Richard Brooks in Atlanta, of Ahmaud Arbery in Atlanta. I could go on and on. And people have been in the streets, and you know this in Philadelphia for sure. People have been in the streets protesting what has been obvious to many of us for generations that in this country, supposedly committed to the basic principles of democracy, the lives of Black people are less valued than others. Given our politics, given our health, given the reality of race, we face a moral reckoning today, a fundamental challenge to what we mean by we the people. So in a time where global, a global pandemic is killing people indiscriminately in this country, especially black and brown people, when our economy has collapsed and those who have the luxury of working from home or who are making money hand over fist demand that some of us, that the most vulnerable among us go back to work and serve them, when people can't pay their bills, their rent, put food on the table, and the planet is screaming because we are killing it, we must engage in this haunting ritual of black grief this haunting public ritual of witnessing black grief. And this is happening again in a moment of political strife. It seems that the ghosts of the country's racist past now haunt out in the open. Political partisanship is firmly connected to deep racial divisions. We see this as politicians exploit white fear, white grievance and resentment for their own political gain. And in the face of what has been by any measure, any measure, no matter your political uh, um, um, orientation, what has been by any measure a disastrous first term, over 70 million Americans voted for a second. 
we could easily say that these, all of these folk are racist. That's too easy, it seems to me. There's an epidemic of selfishness, as I write in my latest piece, that engulfs the nation, that threatens the very notion of the public good, that threatens the very foundation of our democracy. In so many ways, the American idea is in trouble. We have too long told ourselves a story that secures our virtue and protects us from our vices. But today, even in the aftermath of the election, we confront the ugliness of who we are. And that ugliness isn't just about who occupies the White House or murderous police officers or loud racists screaming horrible things. It is the image of children in cages with mucus smeared shirts and soiled pants glaring back at us. It is 666 babies who have been separated from their parents and they can't find them. Parents separated from their children after risking everything to come here only because they believe in the idea and this has happened on our watch. It is just to remind us Oscar Ramirez and his 23 month old daughter face down washed up on the banks of our border. And all of this has happened as is happening in the name of the American idea. Now, as all of this was unfolding, I found myself and is unfolding in some ways, I found myself struggling with despair. I kept saying to myself, the country has done it again. It has betrayed us again. The euphoria of the election of the first black president and the declarations that we had turned the corner was met with the venom of Trump's presidency. And we have been here before. We have had a chance to be otherwise and the nation double down on its ugliness. You think about the civil war and radical reconstruction, what historians call the second founding. Here you see the formation of the modern US nation state, the passage of the civil war amendments, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. All of this was met with Jim Crow or racial apartheid in the South. Frederick Douglass lived long enough to see Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but he also lived long enough to see the state of Mississippi pass the first Jim Crow law. He died a year before the decision of Plessy versus Ferguson rendered in 1896. He called these people the apostles of forgetfulness. The sedimentation of Jim Crow stood alongside what? The conscription of black labor through policing and the criminal convict leasing system or convict leasing conscripted black labor into building cities like Birmingham. And of course the ideology of Anglo-Saxonism. So this is not just a simple, simply a Southern thing, right? The ideology of Anglo-Saxonism defined our imperial efforts abroad. At the very moment in which we're consolidating a racial regime in the South, we're annexing uh, countries full of black and brown people. Our export isn't just simply basket baseball, y'all. Right? At the moment in which we reach for a different way of being as a nation, to be a truly multiracial democracy, the country doubled down on its ugliness, redemption and the lost cause. They even built monuments to an ideology that still dot the landscape. The country doubled down on the belief that white people mattered more than others. The same thing happened in the mid 20th century. The black freedom struggle demanded broad-based inclusion. Historians refer to this period as the second reconstruction, an attempt to fulfill, fulfill the broken promises of the first. But what did we get in response? We got calls for law and order. And those calls aren't just simply coming out of the mouth of, of Richard Nixon. Right? We saw this among those who responded to the nonviolent movement of Dr. King in those civil acts of civil disobedience. There were calls for law and order. We saw elements in the Kerner Commission report in 1968. They didn't implement much of that report except for those uh, claims or calls for a different kind of policing so that black communities would not explode again. That got implemented. Calls for law and order put in place the cornerstone of what would become the carceral state. What did we get in response to the black freedom struggle of the mid 20th century? We got the tax revolt in California which laid the foundation for the shredding of the social safety net, the undermining of the basic social contract that informed the New Deal. 
And then, of course, in 68, the election of Richard Nixon. In 72, the election of Richard Nixon. And then by 1980, we get the fantasy of the Hollywood B-list actor, Ronald Reagan, who declared mourning in America and let's make America great again. In response to Barack Obama, we got the vitriol of the Tea Party, gutting of the Voting Rights Act, voter suppression, voter ID laws, and the eventual election of Donald Trump. At every turn, when we have faced the kind of moral reckoning we now face, we have doubled down on our ugliness. Presidential elections do not settle such things. We do. So it is in light of all of that, what I've just described, that I found myself struggling with despair and rage. And when the two mix, all hell can break loose, you know. I reach for Jimmy, or James Baldwin, I call him Jimmy, for resources to help me understand how to pick up the pieces and how to continue to struggle in light of America's ongoing betrayal. Baldwin insisted that the country confront the lie that sustain its innocent, that sustains its innocence. As he put it in The Fire Next Time, published in 1963, quote, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime. Baldwin relentlessly exposed this epistemic ignorance, the lies that America told itself. In Nothing Personal, an essay he wrote in 1964 to accompany the amazing photographs of Richard Avenden, Baldwin put the point succinctly, quote, we are afraid to reveal ourselves because we trust ourselves so little. Hmm. And in this labyrinth, the person is desperately trying not to find out what he really thinks. Therefore, the truth cannot be told even about one's attitudes. We live by lies. And not only, for example, about race, whatever by this time in this country or indeed in the world this word may, word may mean, but about our very natures. The lie has penetrated our most private moments and the most secret chambers of our heart. Ours is not a country. Ours is not a country where democracy has been achieved. Ours is not a beacon of virtue. Our, is our country is not the shining city on the hill. We tell ourselves this lie in order to protect ourselves from what we've done. Baldwin understood that our problems in the United States went beyond who occupied the White House or the latest example of American racism. For him and for me, we have to get to the rot at the heart of the matter. And this requires that we deconstruct all that the nation holds sacred to tell the truth so that we might release ourselves into a different way of being in the world. How do we keep fighting when the times seem so dark? How do we muster the energy and courage to keep pushing this damn boulder up the hill? Even when someone else is elected, we still hear the clamoring for an old world, a cleaving to an old way of being in the world that would reproduce all of the ugliness that brought us to this moment right now. Baldwin Jimmy had to ask himself those questions. He had to come to terms with what happened to the black freedom struggle in such a short period of time. He had to understand the angry cries of black power, the white fantasy that was Ronald Reagan. He had to tell the truth even as cancer destroyed his body. And here we are after an election but not quite. For the forces unleashed by the latest version of the American fantasy threaten as it has always done to destroy the very foundations of the country. In 1962, James Baldwin published in the New York Times book review an essay entitled, As Much Truth As One Can Bear. The article was an extended meditation on the role of a new generation of writers, among whom Baldwin was fast emerging as a leading voice, and the challenge they faced as American writers, writing in the as American artists writing in the shadow of people like Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Faulkner. These writers, it was argued, 
were and still are sacrosanct and often served as a standard to judge the inadequacy of the younger generation. The past full of these giants was used to bludgeon the present replete with those who inevitably fell short. Now I mentioned this not to engage in an analysis of Baldwin's somewhat impious engagement with the American literary canon, and it was impious, by the way. Rather, it is what he says about the role of the artist, and here he echoes Ralph Waldo Emerson's view of the poet that strikes me as particularly relevant for our times. As Baldwin wrote, quote, the effort to become a great novelist simply involves attempting to tell as much of the truth as one can bear, and then a little more as much as the truth as one can bear, and then a little more. We must, as Baldwin put it, deal with the words, deal with what words hide and what they reveal. This is all the more important in a country like our own, where our stories obscure the horrors of what we've done and ensure our innocence and inherent goodness. Telling the truth here, especially in dark times like our own, requires a certain kind of courage and commitment to shatter national illusions that offer safety and comfort and protect the order of things. It involves risking it all in moments like these in order to release us into a new way of being together. I keep saying that, to release us into a new way of being together. And this will entail at times a withering criticism of the past that haunts and constrains, a scathing critique of our self-conception, even when we think we've just done something quite miraculous. As Baldwin put it, quote, we live in a country in which words are mostly used to cover the sleeper, not to wake him up. And therefore it seems, he says, to me, the adulation so cruelly proffered our elders has nothing to do with their achievement, but has to do with our impulse to look back on what we imagine to have been a happier time. This nostalgia, he says, is an adulation which has panic at the root. I love that formulation. It has, it's an adulation which has panic at the root. Baldwin is unsparing. He goes on to say that, quote, one hears in the work of all American novelists, even including the mighty Henry James, songs of the plains, the memory of a virgin continent mysteriously despoiled Though all dreams were to have become possible here, this did not happen. And the panic then to which I have referred comes out of the fact that we are now confronting the awful question of whether or not all our dreams have failed. How have we managed to become what we have in fact become, he asks. And if we are as indeed we seem to be so empty and desperate, what are we to do about it?" End quote. A longing for a happier time, a kind of nostalgia, allows us to turn our heads away from the difficulties of our days. We were even nostalgic about the time before Donald Trump, nostalgic in such a way that we will invest the current election with some kind of meaning as if we're going to return to some sense of normalcy. Reminded of Dr. King's speech at Montgomery at the end of the Selma March. And he says, I wanna tell you what normal was as those who clamor for normalcy. And he offers a litany of the violence that described Alabama before this monumental march. Hmm? We wanna make America great again, or we pine for the days before our current misery, as if America's in loss of innocence is a recent event, or if, it, or, it, or if as if the issue is the loss of innocence at all. Baldwin insists that we have to ask the hard questions and take the rude positions that get us to the heart of the matter. And what is that? How shall we finally put ourselves in touch with reality? To leave behind the myths and the legends that protect our innocence, that imprison us in a kind of internal, eternal youthfulness. And for Baldwin to be condemned to being eternally young is the corruption of the soul. We can talk about that in q and I'm work, looking at my time, I'm coming home, I promise. No, I'm not. I'm a black preacher at times, you get the point. Baldwin understood the pernicious effects of the lie on America's character, that the lie involved what we tell ourselves 
about black and white people, for example. We tell ourselves that white people ought to be valued more in this country than others. And we witness the monstrous consequences of what follows from this view in terms of our dispositions and our practices. Baldwin insisted, and it is an, insist and it is an insistence that we must follow if we are to survive our own darkness, that we must describe us to ourselves as we now are, as he put it. We must describe us to ourselves as we now are. And in some ways, this formulation allows us, you and me, to see the work of the poet, to in fact be the poet in describing things as they are. America has to choose whether it will finally become a genuinely multiracial democracy. And this involves grappling with the past that continues to haunt our present. That George Floyd or Walter Wallace or Breonna Taylor or Jacob Blake were simply the latest victims of the slave codes that have shaped the way black communities have been and continue to be policed in this country. That we have to tell ourselves the truth about the wealth gap, the achievement gap, the disparities in healthcare revealed by COVID-19, we have to tell ourselves so many truths. For as Baldwin wrote in 62, the trouble is deeper than we wish to think, he said, because the trouble is in us. And what we will never, and we will never conquer an unbearable human isolation. We will never establish human communities until we stare our ghastly failures in the face, he said. This is a challenge that I believe we all must take up. We stand on a knife's edge, that the background conditions of our democracy have cracked. In so many ways, our way of life is broken. We have to understand that today we must do everything to dare to be otherwise. Do everything in our power to break from the old frames that have trapped us in categories that blind us to the humanity of those around us. We have to understand that racial justice, if it is to be genuine, isn't a philanthropic enterprise. It isn't an act of charity. We have to figure out how to live together differently. We have to figure out how to be together differently. And that means committing ourselves to building a country that affirms the dignity and sacrality of every human being, no matter the color of their skin, their zip code, who they love, their gender or ability. It must involve a revolution of value a shift in what and who we value, an ongoing criticism of the very idea of white America. That an America predicated on the belief that white people ought to be valued more than others, that America is irredeemable. But it does not follow from that that we are. It does not follow from that that we are. We have to tell this, ourselves the truth about our failures. And we have to take the risk to do something bold and visionary. What will be our moonshot in this moment? Can we make final, can we finally do something that will change the trajectory of our communities, our towns, our cities of generations? And in doing so, can we be the midwives that we're called to be and give birth to a new America? Now, we all have been birthed in the American fantasy of itself as an example of democracy achieved. That fantasy has distorted and disfigured our moral sense because it requires that we lie to ourselves about what we've done. And a lie that thrives on a kind of willful ignorance makes this place, it makes us monstrous. I believe our task today is to do exactly what Baldwin called for in 1962. Quote, mount an unending attack on all that Americans believe themselves to hold sacred, end quote. It is to unmask the panic at the root. Our elections 
just a few days ago, came at a time of moral reckoning. It wasn't a referendum on the current president. It was a reckoning for us. But I pray that we do not trade one fantasy for another. That Trump's defeat will somehow affirm Americans' inherent goodness and put a grateful republic back to sleep. Presidential elections alone, no matter how momentous, do not settle the question of who we take ourselves to be. The answer to that question will emerge in what we do after the election. We must now risk everything in this moment. Everything. Our own record, as Baldwin wrote, must be read. The air of this time and place is so heavy with rhetoric, he wrote, so thick with soothing lies that one must do great violence to language. One must somehow disrupt the comforting beat in order to be heard. Scream, sing off key. Stand in one's misfittedness. Refuse to be adjusted to the cries to return to what was. In as much truth as one can bear, Baldwin wrote, not everything is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Such powerful words for our country and for you. We cannot stick our heads in the sand this time. We cannot tinker around the edges and leave the old frame intact. We must shake loose from the shibboleths of the past and their gods and begin again. Remember, no matter what has been done, no matter the death that shadows our steps, we cannot turn away from our responsibility. As Jimmy put it in just above my head, responsibility is not lost, it is abdicated. And if one refuses abdication, then one begins again. Let's begin again right where we are. Let's risk everything to finally put the sin of racism behind us and figure out how to be together differently. And that is going to require something extraordinary from you. White America will have to rid itself of the insidious belief that they, that it ought to be valued more than others. And that will be hard work. But as Baldwin says, Human beings are at once miracles and disasters. If we show up, if we risk ourselves in this moment, if we risk everything, we at least have a chance for a miracle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I was uh, getting all the messages from people saying, wow, you're preaching. That's great. Um, you know, as you, as you were speaking, I was thinking about your book came out in January 2020 and everything really broke open in so many ways. Um, and in so many ways, we are in a very similar place today as perhaps Baldwin saw our country in the late 60s and early the early 70s with the failure of the Great Society, the, 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 the so many disappointments and failures that the Civil Rights Movement did not achieve what people hoped it would achieve the Vietnam War, um, at a moment that seemed almost unbearable um, to keep going. Um, and then like that, I think one of the one of the first questions that we have here um, are, are the votes in the selection that we just had were 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 pretty much split down the middle and never neither about 40% of the electorate didn't even vote. Um, so one of our, our guests tonight asked against such figures, how can we have a basis for hope? Well, you know, there's a wonderful formulation that Baldwin offers in 1970. He says, hope is invented every day, right? So there's no guarantee here. This is not Panglossian optimism. So this isn't Voltaire's Candide, right? And it's also not Schopenhauer and pessimism, right? This is not just the world is just going to hell by definition, right? It depends upon what we do. We do know that this, this election, more Americans voted than ever, right? That, Joe Biden received the most votes for the presidency than anyone ever in the history of running for the office. And Donald Trump came in second. 
Uh, and so uh, there is a sense in which the urgency of now made itself known. But as long as we live in a society where there are folks who are disposable, folks who can be cast to the margins and into the shadows, um, we're gonna see numbers, the percentage of folks who are disaffected, who don't believe the political process, the political system has anything to say to their lives or to speak to their lives. So until we build the kind of society, what Baldwin calls the New Jerusalem, that will affirm the humanity and sacrality of every person, um, we will probably continue to see those numbers. But where is hope found? In us, right? Um, Bald, uh, you know, Bald, Du Bois calls it a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. That's a, that's a blues soaked hope. And so I'm not naive that we will succeed, but I do know that if we don't try, we will fail. And a, a follow up to that, um, I think, do you, do you feel at all hopeful in that a significant number of, of people, I say white people today, seem to be looking at racism and learning what it means to be an anti-racist, um, maybe for the first time, um, that this is maybe a very different way of looking at the issues, especially for white America than in the 1960s? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think looking at the protest, uh, looking at the folk who decided to risk their lives in the midst of a global, pan of, you know, a global pandemic that is indiscriminately killing people, um, one, one um, can certainly uh, find uh, uh, hope in what, what we see and what we've experienced. But, you know, we don't want to run ahead of ourselves because, you know, Americans have a tendency to want to pat, pat themselves on the back very quickly and then settle down. So the, the assessment of where we are, right, isn't in yet. You know, um, we have to see what happens. Um, so, um, we're in the midst of, we're in the eye of the storm. The tail is coming. So yes, I find hope there, but I'm not settled. I'm not settling in yet, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of continue in this line with some of these questions. I'm moving them around a little bit. Um, sure. As we talk about hope and move to Baldwin's call for rigorous truth telling, how do we revive a commitment to rigorous truth telling when the very notion of truth as a shared value and reality has been shredded and eroded so dramatically and persistently in public discourse over the past four years? My Lord, that's such an important question, you know? And let me be, let me just be very clear before we continue on. I do not want to pretend as if I have all the answers. I'm struggling to keep my head on my shoulders, struggling to hold myself together in the midst of these dark times. So I don't wanna pretend as if I have all the answers. What does it mean to bear witness in a moment where we're not even post-truth, we're post-truthiness, <laughs> right? We're post-truthiness, we're post that Colbert formulation where you know, you know, people can just lie with impunity and just, and move on. Uh, hypocrisy is just unfettered, there's no cost. Um, we can't allow that to dictate uh, how we orient ourselves to the world. We have to, in the midst of, of all of that, continue to bear witness, to tell the truth, and to do what James Baldwin called following Henry James, and that is to take, to ask hard questions and to take rude positions. Um, and, and we need to do that even more now than before. So I want to move into Baldwin a little bit. Um, and I have to say to everybody that his, uh, Professor Glaude's book is, is really profound. As you can hear, he is a poet and a witness, and he witnesses to Baldwin's efforts at speaking truth um, so eloquently. So I encourage you, if you have not, check it out from our library, buy it, um, and, um, and, and read it, and start conversations about it. Um, so I want to, I, I think starting with going, going to Baldwin, if, if folks have not delved deeply into Baldwin, and as they read your book, where should they start with Baldwin? What are some, what, what would be one or two works that they would really be great introductions to Baldwin? Okay, I just wanted to prove that my bookshelf is real. Uh, <laughs> you know, the library, you know, if, it all depends whether or not you want to start with the fiction or the nonfiction, right? And 
I think the, the Library of America edition edited by Toni Morris and others nonfiction is the perfect place to start. Um, you will begin with Notes of a Native Son and it will walk you all the way through. The problem with the book, of course, is that it doesn't include uh, the last book, which is The Evidence of Things Not Seen, um, which is the book about the Atlanta child murders. But I think it's to begin here is with his nonfiction allows you to see the through line of his work and to see its evolution, where the accents change, right? When the accent to goo becomes the accent to grab, you know, this, these sorts of, things. what happens when that happens, you know, what, what, how does he shift? And then we can begin to hunt down the nature of those shifts, right? So I would urge people to start at the beginning of the Library of America edition of Baldwin's collected non-work, non-fiction writings. Right. Test note, get that on bookshop.org. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and, and what, um, here's another one. Um, so Baldwin spent a lot of his life, adult life, living abroad, coming back and forth. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and here's a question about wondering how you think he might feel about the rising populism in Europe towards um, people from non-white majority nations and how does that compare with what's happening in America, in America today? Is it sort of like this global fever that's happening or? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that's a great question. You know, Baldwin, you know, in 1948 leaves the United States and, and goes to Paris. And he says he, he would have gone anywhere. I, I think he's not telling the truth there um, because there's an expat community there. Richard Wright is there, but he goes and he, he, he goes to, he leaves the ghetto of Harlem and, and makes his way to, to, to Paris and wills himself into becoming one of the world's greatest writers. While in Paris, right, he, he didn't, he came to see and understand the myth of France, right? He, you know, he understood that he didn't trade the lives of the U.S. in order to embrace the lives of France, right? And he, he talks, he writes about this in relation to how the French treated the Algerians. Baldwin, I, I couldn't imagine him finding comfort in, in Istanbul today, you know, in Erdogan's Istanbul, you know, that would be odd. You know, what would he say about Orban in Hungary? What would he think about, um, uh, these populist forces, right-wing populist forces in Europe, he would, I think, I don't want to anticipate what he would say because that's hubris. But, you know, what I would say is that this is a reflection of an economic, uh, an e a political and economic ideology that has um, failed and the contradictions have revealed themselves in such a way that people are reaching for old languages old ideology, so authoritarianism and neo-fascism, right, become the way in which people deal with their misery by scapegoating the stranger, to use that old, old word, right? So I think, and in Baldwin's corpus, there are resources to talk about this, right? Because he understands the modern condition and what the modern condition requires. It oftentimes is to externalize the violence that is happening inside, right, in order to in order to hold, a, to, to maintain the, the wholeness of a fragile identity, you need to attack another, right? Um, and so what we're seeing is precarity across the globe and particularly in the industrialized world. And that precarity, that vulnerability is being displaced onto populations, right? As the reason and cause for it, right? I keep telling people in the US, I said, you know, everybody's banking on young folk and I keep telling them, the Proud Boys are not baby boomers. The Boogaloo Boys are not baby boomers. Dylan Roof was not a baby boomer. That the same folks are reaching for languages because our world is broken. Our way of life is broken. Some are reaching for progressive languages. Some are reaching for old, dark, insidious languages. And we have to understand that for what it is. I have two. I have, I have similar questions come from two different two different angles. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you each one separately. One says, you know, I live in a, a well-meaning, mostly white suburb that voted 80% for Obama. There are Black Lives Matter signs everywhere, but here's the problem. There are no Black Lives. The average income is $90,000 and houses are out of the reach 
for many Black families, what can well-meaning whites do to get beyond being lawn sign liberals? Ooh, lawn sign liberals. You might hear that on MSNBC. I just want to let you know. <laughs> lawn sign liberals. Now, this That's is a good one, right? I, yeah, I kept saying over and over again in the talk that we have to figure out a way to be together differently. It's easy to tear down Confederate statues, right? It's easy to tear, to tear down those kinds of monuments. But what if I tell you that highway systems in Chicago are monuments, that zoning laws are monuments, right? That that's a more difficult kind of task. Think about what happened in New York, for example, a couple of, you know, a year or so ago, uh, when they, were, they realized how deeply segregated the New York public school system was. And they decided that they were going to figure out how to desegregate it and look at all of those lawns well, I couldn't say they don't have lawns. How about penthouse? I'm thinking about the Upper West Side window <laughs> poster <laughs> uh, liberals. And, and they screamed foul at the top of their lungs. Yeah. Because if racial justice is seen as a zero sum game or as a philanthropic enterprise, when there is a shift that seemed to suggest a shift that seems to suggest a change in who gets advantaged and who gets disadvantaged, all hell break loose, breaks loose. So how do we change that? I have no idea besides describing it honestly. What does it mean to say that people can't afford the 90,000, you know, you know, make the 90,000? Well, one thing it means that we have to address questions of education, we have to address issues of living wage, we have to lay the foundational um, conditions, we have to put in place the foundation or the conditions under which people can make the kind of money to live in neighborhoods where they want to live, right, or where they can live. Um, so there are all of these preconditions that can lead to the integration of that neighborhood. But we live in a society that is so stratified between the haves and the have nots. So much so that even Alan Greenspan said that this wealth inequality is not sustained. So we have to figure out how to, how to make, how to live. I mean, I've said it over and over again. You get the point. I don't quite know the answer. But well, here's another question then, thank you. Um, from another, from someone else who's saying, how, how, how can we be midwives together? You write about Baldwin moving beyond his hope that white people will see the error of their ways. And clearly he spoke to us as black people about the importance of seeing where the lie lives in us, where we collude with the lie. Can you please speak more about what we as black Americans need to do to tell our truths, face our trauma and move beyond the lie? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a wonderful question. First, we have to stop dancing. We have to take off the mask. You know, the thing is, is that because we understand the consequences of white fear, we're constantly muting ourselves because mm -hmm. we don't want to trigger it. Because we know what white fear can generate. So we dance the dance, you see. And so as long as we become complicit in the way in which the value gap works and the lies that sustain it, then we reproduce it. You know, we reproduce it. It's like that moment when Baldwin says to those young Howard students and among those students in 63 in the apartment, when they have to go get bootleg liquor because Jimmy needed his scotch, right? Um, he says, if you promise me that you will never believe what the world says about you, I will promise you that I will never betray you. Now, what does it mean not to believe what the world says about you? How does that evidence itself in the way in which we navigate space and time, right? My job is not to make you comfortable. My job is not to rage unnecessarily, right? My job is to try to figure out, my task is to be, to figure out what that means, right? In all of its complexity and all of its uncertainty, right? Um, and so we have to stop being complicit. Understand that the moment, here's a line, Baldwin says, the moment we step outside of the orbit of their expectations of us, we're talking revolution. I just love that formulation. And it's not about you know, demonizing white people, it's about what our roles are within a society that has been organized 
along the lines of the value gap, as I call it. We have to stop dancing. We have to stop wearing the mask. We have to stop muting ourselves and just be. Thank you. Um, here's another, I've been going through trying to figure out, there's so many great questions. Um, this one asks, uh, a fascination with, with Baldwin's ability to hold on to rage and love at the same time, which really seems to me that the epitome as he puts it of the human condition. Um, and in this moment in time, it feels as though there is more rage and more divisiveness. Uh, so the, the person asks, in the context of history, is this perception accurate? And most importantly, is it surmountable? Well, I'm not sure so much about it is more so now than it has been in the past. I'm not quite convinced of that. Is it surmountable? Yes. And let me just say, these are some wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Um, Rage lights, you know, I say, to, I say to people, you know, the reason why many people um, ignore, or ignore or denigrate the late Baldwin, the later works, is because he's angry. They say that his bitterness has, you know, overwhelmed his pen. That he's traded in, the anger has led him to trade in his aesthetics you know, for, for politics and propaganda, as it were. But for Baldwin, rage lights the kiln, right? And you have to, you have to encounter it, right? It is a purifying force. But rage never transforms into hatred. Baldwin is very clear about the destructive nature of hatred. There's this wonderful line, and it's the line that is so important for me. It, it almost brings me to tears every time I, I cite it. He's resigning from The Liberator, which is a nationalist, black nationalist um, publication because of anti-Semitism, right? He's resigning from their board. And he says, he's basically saying, we can't become them. We can't become monstrous, right? Monstrous, we can't let our hatred overwhelm. But then he says, I want us to do something unprecedented. I want us to create a self without the need for enemies. Mm. Mm. To create a self without the need for enemies. You can't get to that unless you are rageful about the injustice of the moment. You can't get to that, right? Singing Kumbaya. You got to walk through the fire to get to that, to get to that notion. So is it surmountable? I will bank my all on it. I have to but I'd be damned if we have to mute it, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have a few people who are curious uh, for your thoughts too. You know, we're talking about reading Baldwin, reading your book. Um, Baldwin is such an incredible storyteller. Who else should we be including in that, this new canon that we're creating? Who should we, we who else ought we to be reading right now to, access the rage, to access the love, to access the hope, to help us see the world in, in new ways, in truthful ways. Oh my God, it's so much. Um, <laughs> Can't we just come and stand in front of your, uh, your, uh, your, your bookshelf? <laughs> so, so I would urge everyone to read Casey Lehman's Heavy. It's a wonderful memoir. Um, let's read Robert P. Jones's White Too Long, which is uh, the Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity is an extraordinary book. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Oh, you have to read The Yellow House, right, by Sarah Broon, National Book Award. It's an extraordinary book about New Orleans and the complexity of New Orleans. I would urge everyone to read everything that Imani Perry has written, but this wonderful book, Looking for Lorraine, it's great. And she's in Philadelphia, so this is great, wonderful text. Oh my God, there's so much out there. I can go on and on and on, right? On and on and on and on and on. And on. Um, so, so those are just some quick authors. And then we got to go back to the classics, you know? You have to go back, you got to read some Gabo, 
read some Gabriel Garcia Marquez, read some some Chekhov and some Tolstoy. Um, get yourself, you know, I've been I've been in this reading group with Cornell West since the um, since the the pandemic uh, broke off, and we've been reading. Well, we, you know, Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscura, uh, Chekhov's The Student, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. We've been going through making up, you know, we've read Richard Wright's Notes of Another. We've been reading all of, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks' The Last Quatrain of Emmett Till. Again, I think there, there, there is a bibliography out there for us to, to understand the complexity of the human drama, because that's what this is, yeah. Yeah. right? That's what this is. This is this ongoing struggle of what it means to be a human being on its on his or her way to death. And in the interim, what the hell are we going to do with the life that we have? Why well, you sound like a, um, 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 Oliver, the, 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 the poet, right? <laughs> what are you going to do with that one <laughs> life that you have? Mm. Um, so what if we're going to do something with this one life that we have, if we're going to reach for the moonshot, if we're going to join together as midwives in, in creating the country that we are called to be, that we claim that we want to be. Um, final question is, is what, what are some of those risks that we must take, whether we're white, whether we're black, whether we're Latinx or, or Asian American, what are the risks that we must take? Um, where must we be willing to stand or move? You know, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to presume that I have the answer again, right? Uh, I'm a Democrat, small d, right? And we gotta, we gotta answer that question together uh, in organizing and working for, the more, for a more just world. When I get asked this question, what can we do? What can we do? The first thing I keep at, I, my first answer is to say, what is your conception of a just world? Let's get clear on that. What is your idea of a just world? That if, you, if you're working 40 hours a week, you should be able to take care, keep a roof over your head and take care of your kids and put food on the table. If that's the case, then you believe in a living wage. If you believe a just world is that if you get sick that you shouldn't lose everything, then you have a more, then you have a sense of what healthcare is all about, that people shouldn't be making money head over heels because people are sick and the like. If you believe that every child, no matter their uh, color, their zip code, uh, whatever, that they should have an education that allows them not only to dream dreams, but to make those dreams a reality, what is your conception of justice? Right? We have to enter into a new moral and social contract with each other. What are our shared goods? How do those, how do those shared goods inform our understanding of the public good? And we need to build a society that reflects it. We need to elect people who are committed to it. But the answer to your question is Ms. Baker's, Ella Baker's answer, right? Where you need to start is right in front of you. What is your conception of a just world? Align your efforts with the organization that is doing that work. And together, we can build a new Jerusalem. God willing. Thank you. Wow. This has just been wonderful. I, I, I have no doubt that everybody, as you see from all the questions that we're pouring in, um, we've been um, transfixed and moved and challenged. Um, all, all, all that we need on an evening, evening light tonight. And I, I thank you so much on behalf of everyone. Um, going across the screen, I just don't even want to talk about this now because I'm in a, in a different place right now thinking of all that, that we've just been talking about. Um, subscribe to our newsletter, join and become a member and, and keep our conversation going. Um, join into our other, other upcoming programs and events that are coming again, bookshop.org backslash shop backslash Phila Athenaeum. You can purchase Professor Gloud's book and um, Tess will, I'm sure, be finding some of these other books and putting them up there on our curated list as well for you to find. And we look forward to seeing you at future programs. Professor Glaude, I hope we can have you back again sometime when we can have you in our space, face to face, talking together. This has just been wonderful. It's been, it's been a gift. It's my pleasure. I look forward to that time. Thank you.
Thank you and blessings to you as you go on to probably even more um, <laughs> tonight, Zooms. tomorrow on, more Zooms. <laughs> Everybody, please stay safe. Please stay safe. We're in the midst of this thing and it's in its third peak. So be, be diligent uh, and be mindful. So stay safe, stay safe and walk in love. Appreciate you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, sir. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.